We have now reached the end of this course. I will now briefly summarize some of the key points we have discussed. First, we have learned that modern computers are massively parallel and basically all new performance that we have in our brand new computers comes from parallelism. You have already got a more than factor 100 difference between sequential and parallel performance in your computer. And while we get more and more new arithmetic performance thanks to parallelism, it gets more and more difficult to keep the processor busy as the main memory is just so ridiculously slow. We've learned about two different kinds of processors that we have in all computers these days. There is the CPU that has got multiple parallel arithmetic units that perform vector operations in a pipeline manner. And there is the GPU, where the technical details and terminology is somewhat different, but you got again multiple parallel arithmetic units that perform wide operations in a pipeline manner. We've seen that from the programmer's perspective, these two kinds of processors unfortunately are rather different. In both cases, you will need to parallelize your code, but the specific techniques are very different. In CPUs, you will arrange your code so that there is plenty of room for instruction level parallelism, and then on top of that, you use, for example, OpenMP for multi-threading, and finally use vector types to benefit from vector operations. In GPUs, you basically just create tons of threads, but there you will need to keep in mind that threads in GPUs are not entirely independent. They are organized in blocks, and blocks consist of warps of 32 threads. While the technical details look different and may evolve a lot over time, the key principles are, however, always the same. To benefit from any kind of parallelism, you need to design algorithms in which there are lots of independent operations that you can perform in parallel. Once you have that, the rest is just engineering. And if you don't have that, no form of parallelism is available. In addition to having lots of independent operations, it would be also good to try to arrange things so that you've got lots of similar independent operations. This way, you can much more easily benefit from vector operations, and you are also making the life of the GPU easier, as the GPU executes the entire warp always in a synchronous manner. And as memory tends to be always very slow, no matter what kind of memory you are talking about, you want to design your algorithms so that you can do lots of useful arithmetic operations per memory access. Now, let me conclude by saying a couple of words about the future. How is the hardware going to evolve in the coming years? One thing that we are seeing for sure is wider vector units. You can already buy computers that have got 512-bit vector registers. So now one vector can already hold 16 single precision floating point numbers. Another thing we are starting to see is the development of other kinds of processors besides CPUs and GPUs. For example, Google has developed what they call tensor processing units, which are GPU-like devices that have got special hardware for doing matrix multiplication in a massively parallel manner, which is a key operation when you do machine learning with neural networks. And a related somewhat surprising development is that we are seeing more and more hardware support for very low precision floating point arithmetic. So you can get even more parallelism these days, but it comes at a cost. You will need to tolerate large rounding errors. Another thing that is possibly coming to our hardware is so-called transactional memory. This is something that would change the way in which you can write your parallel programs. Instead of using, for example, critical sections to prevent many threads from accessing the same element simultaneously, you could use memory a bit like a transactional database. You could begin a transaction, 
read and write memory without any coordination and then try to commit the changes. The system would keep track of what different threads are doing and it would let the transaction commit if there are no conflicts. And otherwise you would roll back and try again. There's already some hardware support for such a model of programming in recent CPUs. It will be interesting to see how successful this is going to be in the long run. This is now all that I wanted to say in these lectures. I really hope you learned a lot of useful new ideas and acquired new skills that will help you in your career. Of course, we only scratched the surface in this course and there is a lot more that you can learn about both practice and theory of designing efficient algorithms and writing efficient programs in modern computers. For example, one big aspect that we didn't discuss at all in this course is computation using multiple computers. And I strongly recommend you to also take some courses that are related to topics such as computer networks, network protocols, and distributed computing to get also some idea of the new challenges that you have as soon as you start to parallelize computations across multiple machines in a network. Now it's time to thank all of you and say goodbye. Please don't forget to give feedback on this course. 